Right. Okay. So um, this is fantastic. So welcome to these um, third talk of the Corpus Linguistics and Applied Linguistics Research 2023 uh, edition. This is a series of talks sponsored by the University of Murcia on the Faculty of Humanities, Facultad de Letras, and my very own research uh, group. Um, in this uh, edition, we've had uh, Dr. Niall Carey in October 11th, Dr. Jesse Eckbert last week, October 18th, and next week we will have Dr. Magali uh, Parkwald, uh, October uh, 30th. Today we have uh, Isabella Clark, and I'll be talking about Isabella in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, you can check out these talks uh, on our website. And uh, uh, these talks are really popular, and uh, um, I think I feel so grateful to the speakers that, uh, in a very generous way, share their research with with so many people that maybe sometimes it is not so easy uh, uh, for them, for us, to actually reach out and get to listen to these researchers uh, first firsthand. A little bit of history again, 2021, we kicked off. It was just post COVID-19. We thought it was okay to have a, an online uh, corpus linguistics uh, series. So we had fantastic speakers in this uh, edition. 2022, we said, mm, okay, let's see if this still works. And it really worked very well. Again, fantastic speakers and a wide range of different topics and research uh, methodologies and methods, uh, all in terms of um, the analysis or the use, better, uh, the use of corpus linguistics uh, research methods. Today we have Dr. Isabel Clark. Um, um, Isabel Clark is, uh, can I say, a young researcher, maybe? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, is um, uh, Isabel's uh, impact on uh, corpus linguistics research is uh, fantastic. He's been looking not only at uh, uh, like new methods in corpus linguistics, especially in the use of keyword analysis, although we'll be, we will listen to these in more detail later, but also she has looked at uh, the discourse in social media uh, discourse analysis, and in particular, uh, she has extensively researched uh, representation issues uh, concerning, uh, for example, uh, uh, the uh, Islam, something which has a great tradition in Lancaster, when uh, the, uh, the uh, research team there started to look at these in 20, 2008, and then with the fantastic publications in 2013, if I remember well, uh, with the representation of Islam project just back now 10 years ago so it's so good to have a new revisiting of these uh, um, topic and uh, uh, approaches 10 years after that uh, uh, research in 2013. Uh, some of the papers that Isabel Clarks has written are keywords through time tracking changes in press discourses uh, of uh, Islam. Uh, this is a 2022, if I remember well. <laughs> yeah. And probably more recent paper is the representation of Islamism in the uh, UK press, together with Kevin Brooks, uh, uh, Tony McHenry, that we also had last year in these in these talks. Also, uh, a chapter if i remember well online discourses of toxic uh, masculinity uh, which i want to read as soon as possible which is a fantastic uh, uh, fascinating research uh, topic and area so i will stop there uh, you can check out uh, uh, isabel's uh, cv and publications uh, on the uh, lancaster uh, website i highly recommend you guys have a look and check out uh, her research there. So without further uh, ado, uh, uh, Isabel, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. And I suppose uh, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you so much again. I will stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Okay, everyone's seen my screen. Lovely. <laughs> so hello everyone, my name is Isabel Clark and today I'm going to be talking about multiple correspondence analysis and how this can be used for corpus linguistics research. In particular, I'm going to be focusing on two different approaches that I've used for um, multiple correspondence analysis and introduce. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> Um, so firstly, what is multiple correspondence analysis? Well, multiple correspondence analysis is a geometric data analytical method which enables the identification and visualization of the most dominant relationships between three or more categorical variables in a low dimensional space. Now, multiple correspondence analysis is a dimension reduction method. And dimension reduction is a process of reducing a number of variables, a large number of variables in a data set to a smaller number of variables or a smaller number of dimensions. And the aim is to retain as much information as possible. It's used to explain the variation found in the data in a fewer number of dimensions than the actual number of variables. And it's often used to make it easier to visualize data by identifying relationships that exist with, between the variables and amongst the individuals. So in general, multiple correspondence analysis is used to analyze questionnaire or survey data. And this is because it's able to identify groups of individuals who have answered similarly to the questions, as well as identify the associations between the questions, the answers of the questions. So what answers are selected together most often and what answers are rarely selected together. Now, the approach was popularized by Jean-Paul Benzacri, who used it to analyze sociological data from questionnaires. Now, this is just an example here of a sociological study, not one by Jean-Paul Benzacri, but this uses multiple correspondence analysis on a data set from a questionnaire investigating sexual fantasies. Thought I'd get a bit racy here, it's, it's half past four in the afternoon, <laughs> but investigating sexual fantasies across different genders and sexual orientations in young adults. And this is just to illustrate how multiple correspondence analysis works. And Multiple correspondence analysis is used to visualize the relationships between people and their responses to the questions in terms of distance. And it produces two clouds of points where the points on one cloud represent the people and the points on the other are the responses to the questions. And the distance between each point is based on how similar they are to each other in terms of their distribution. So points representing people are closer together in the space if they give the same responses to the questions and points representing responses to the questions are closer together if they are distributed similarly across the people. So in other words, if many people select the same responses, then those responses are closer together in the space. So what these two, these two plots show uh, these two plots are just two dimensions from the cloud of points. So essentially the cloud of points is a high dimensional cloud and we just extract dimensions from, from there and then this positions it on a, on a kind of axis. So these two plots are um, just two dimensions from the cloud of points, dimension one and dimension number two. And these two dimensional plots reveal what the study found. And what it found is that this sexual fantasy study, it found that sexual heterosexual women tended to not have many sexual fantasies. So if you look at the variables um, here on, on this particular side, you'll see that they all have underscore N, which means that it was it was like a yes or no data set, binary data set. And so they didn't have any, many sexual fantasies. And over here on this particular side, those that are color coded in red are heterosexual women. So, um, so that's what it shows there. And then it also shows that um, there's an, quite a lot of overlap here between these two groups, and these are homosexual men and bisexual men. And so this indicates that there's overlap between the, these two groups within, in terms of their sexual fantasy. So through this approach, we can find where there are similarities and differences between two groups in terms of the variables. So that's what the approach is used for. Now, how does multiple correspondence analysis show these associations? Well, as a dimension reduction method, multiple correspondence analysis produces a series of dimensions reflecting the most common patterns of variation in the data set. Now, each dimension represents a distinct pattern of co-variation. The pattern of variations are revealed by assigning each category of a variable and each individual a positive or negative coordinate and the value indicating its contribution to the dimension. 
So for the next dimension, the same the same text or the same person would be assigned a different coordinate or contribution um, for, for a different dimension. Now, coordinates reflect the nature of the association between the categories of the variables in terms of proximity, where categories of variables distributed in similar ways in the individuals have coordinates that are closer together in the space, um, so they'll be on the same side of the origin, whereas categories of variables that are not distributed in similar ways are positioned on opposite ends of the origin. So one will have a positive coordinate and one will have a negative coordinate. So just looking at this plot from the sexual fantasy study, when the fantasies are closer together in the space, this means that they are selected together often by people, whereas when they are in opposite quadrants, this indicates that they are rarely selected together by lots of people. So, for instance, uh, people who fantasize about having sex with or with another person who is a transsexual rarely or never fantasize about someone that's a prostitute so that this is obviously just based on a small group of people but that's how that's how it works um so those that are rarely selected those options that are never selected together would be positioned further apart but those that are selected to get often by the same a large number of people would be positioned closer together in the space now, in addition to coordinates, as I said, the um, multiple correspondence analysis also assigns contributions to each of the variables and each of the individuals as well. And the contributions show which categories of variables are the most important contributors to the dimensions. Now, contributions don't have polarity, so this is unlike um, other kind of multivariate statistical techniques. Um, so as a result, we have to use the coordinates and the contributions together in order to work out which are the most important contributors. And so when we come in, when it comes to interpreting them, we interpret the categories of variables with strong contributions and positive coordinates together, and we interpret them in opposition to those with negative coordinates that are strongly contributing as well. And LaRue and Ruinet, I'd strongly recommend if you're interested in multiple correspondence analysis, this book is great for a real good introduction to it. Um, one that's very nice as well. It assumes no prior mathematical knowledge. Um, and it and it's um they advise to only interpret those that are contributing above the average contribution. So we want to make sure that we're interpreting the ones that are most important. And this is similar to other multivariate statistical techniques where you have a cutoff um, for the variables that you're interested in and want to look at. So again, just looking at this plot, um, each of the, the fantasies, the categories of the fantasies have been color coded according to their contribution. Um, so those that contribute the most to a dimension are those that this, that distinguish the individuals most clearly. So these are the ones that are really important to this particular pattern. So, um, so these are the ones that I'd say like are in the yellow and up to the red. So these are the ones that we will be looking at if we were interpreting this particular dimension. Whereas the blue ones were, were not really interesting because they're not providing so much variation. So what do we do with these results? Um, well, multiple correspondence analysis reveals the associations between the variables and the associations between the individuals. And But the general assumption is that these associations are not random, but there's really an underlying reason for these these groups to be selecting the same fantasies or this, these groups that, or in terms of what I'll be presenting later, why these texts are similar. Um, and so it's the task of the analyst to interpret why the variables co-occur and co-vary. So with the sexual fantasy study, the gender and the sexual orientation was used to explain why those fantasies co-occurred and co-varied. Um, but again, this could be, you could use a variety of different variables. Now, one thing that um, can help in interpreting the dimensions is by seeing if other variables are associated with the patterns identified. And multiple correspondence analysis actually enables this through the inclusion of supplementary variables. Now, such supplementary variables do not contribute to the dimensions. They don't impact the analysis or any, in any way, but you can use them to assess if particular dimensions are associated with them. Um, and these variables, these supplementary variables can be qualitative or quantitative. And this is unlike, so the, the variables that you analyze within multiple correspondence analysis have to be categorical, so they can't be quantitative. So only supplementary variables can be quantitative. Um, but yeah, for example, it, with the 
it, the, your supplementary variables could be age or cultural background, for instance. But with the sexual fantasy study, if this that that fantasy study was look, looking at young people, but if it wanted to include other ages, then we might find that older people our older participants had a different pattern in of their particular fantasies and so we could include that as a supplementary variable and we might be able to see whether that was associated with a different dimension so that's just an example of how supplementary variables might work so to summarize uh, i know i've i spoke i thought i wanted to give you quite general introduction to multiple correspondence analysis before i go into a more linguistic side of, of it and how it can be applied to corpus linguistic in corpus linguistics but essentially multiple correspondence analysis is an approach for identifying and visualizing relationships between three or more categorical variables and as a result the approach produces two clouds of high dimensional points one for the variables and one for the individuals. And the distance between the points indicates how similar they are. And it's the task of the analyst to interpret why the variables are associated and co-occur and why the individuals are similar in terms of the variables or dissimilar in terms of the variables as well. So that's the summary. <laughs> so that's multiple correspondence analysis. Now, how can this be used for corpus linguistics? Well, I have used it to develop two new approaches the first approach I've used it for um, is for multidimensional analysis, specifically for short text multidimensional analysis. Now, what is multidimensional analysis? Well, multidimensional analysis is an approach for uncovering the major patterns of functional linguistic variation across a corpus of texts. The approach is based on the notion of linguistic co-occurrence, which suggests that frequent patterns of co-occurring linguistic features tend to reveal at least one communicative function. So in essence, if two texts have similar frequencies of particular linguistic features, then the assumption is that these two texts will share at least one communicative function. Uh, and you can also do this vice versa. If you had two persuasive texts, the assumption is that these two texts will likely share similar patterns and frequencies of linguistic features. Now, based on this notion of linguistic co-occurrence, multidimensional analysis is aimed at identifying the most common patterns of linguistic co-occurrence across a corpus of texts. And it does this by firstly tagging each text for a variety of different linguistic features. And these can be tense and aspect markers, specialised verbs and adverbs, pronouns and so on and so forth. Then a computer script is used to go through each text in the corpus and record in a data matrix, like here, um, the normalized rates of occurrence of each linguistic feature within that particular text. So as you can see here, each row represents a particular text, each column is a linguistic feature, and each cell represents the relative frequency of that linguistic feature in that particular text. So as you can see here, text A has past tense verbs occur 18.1 times per 1,000 words. Once you've got this data matrix, the next step is to subject this to a multivariate statistical technique called factor analysis. Now, factor analysis is a dimension reduction method. I've just explained what a dimension reduction method is. And it essentially, it's used to identify patterns amongst numerous measured variables, which can be explained in terms of a smaller number of underlying dimensions or latent constructs. That's the technical term. And when factor analysis is applied to the relative frequencies of linguistic features in, in, the, corpus of a, in the text of a corpus, then what this reveals is it reveals a smaller number of dimensions consisting of the most dominant patterns of linguistic co-occurrence in the corpus of the te of texts. And so then based on the notion of linguistic co-occurrence, these dimensions of co-occurring linguistic features are then interpreted for the underlying communicative function. So that's a brief introduction to multidimensional analysis generally, but one limitation with Douglas Weber's multidimensional analysis is that it's not really able to analyze short texts. As with many quantitative approaches, the analysis of short texts is very problematic. And this is because the standard approach for frequency based analysis is to measure the relative frequencies of linguistic features in texts. 
And this is so that texts of different lengths can be reliably compared. So if I had three texts, all of them have 50 nouns in, but text A has a thousand words, text B has 2000 words, and text C has 3000 words. They've, they might have the same raw frequency of nouns, but text, what, text A has three times the amount of nouns as text C because it's three times smaller um, than that and text C. So as a result, we, we look at the relative frequencies of features so that they're all placed on the same scale. But the problem with relative frequencies of features in short text is that they're not really very meaningful. For example, consider this text sample of 11 words um, that, that this says, the smelly man ate the stinky sandwich in the foul smelling toilet. I mean, I made, I made this sentence up, but it has three attributive adjectives, smelly, stinky, and foul smelling. These all come um, before the noun. And if we were to compute the relative frequency of these linguistic features it, of attributive adjectives in this sentence, we would have 273 attributive adjectives per a thousand words. And even the most descriptive of texts come nowhere near this rate. Even if you just took a, a, a one page sample out of a really descriptive text, you just wouldn't have the same, the same frequency or relative frequency as this particular sentence which is highly descriptive. <laughs> um, and so, so the, um, previous um, research has said that the relative frequencies of most grammatical forms become accurate in text samples of around a thousand words. That was Doug Barber in 1993. But then more research has, has investigated this and found that uh, probably around 500 words, the relative frequencies of features become more accurate, um, especially more accurate estimations of text samples um, and so and this is really dependent on how rare your feature set is so if you're looking at high frequency grammatical features you can probably have shorter text but if you're looking at more rarer features then you need larger samples of text I think that's what Doug was saying in when he was talking about thousand words if we're looking at really rare features like um, verb complement clauses or something like that then then you might need a, a larger a larger sample. And so as a result of this limitation, multidimensional analysis cannot be applied to short texts, um, at least not short text individually. There are different ways to deal with short texts that have been proposed, i.e. through concatenation and, and merging texts together, but I'm not interested in that. Uh, I wasn't interested in concatenation. And so, but what I was interested in was developing an approach that can be used um, to analyze short texts. And so this is what I did. Um, in this approach, texts are tagged in much the same way as um, standard multidimensional analysis, but rather than measure the relative frequencies of linguistic features, instead we measure the occurrence of a linguistic feature. Sorry. Um, and so in other words, it, is the linguistic feature present or absent? And so then you record this in a similar data matrix, but now rather than continuous data, so the relative frequencies, we now have a categorical table with presences and absences. Now, because the, the table is now categorical, it means that we cannot use factor analysis. And this is because factor analysis doesn't really work well on categorical data. And so instead we use multiple correspondence analysis, which is very similar to factor analysis, but it deals specifically with categorical data, i.e. present or absent categories that's what categorical data stands for essentially multiple correspondence analysis is used much like factor analysis as in standard multi-dimensional analysis but so to, to essentially to reduce the number of linguistic features into a smaller number of underlying dimensions um, that represent the underlying uh, the, the most common patterns of co-occurring linguistic features in the corpus and then just like uh, standard multidimensional analysis, these dimensions are then interpreted for the underlying communicative function. So that's the short text multidimensional analysis. And I've successfully applied this approach to um, corpora of short texts, including tweets, as well as corpora of language turns, um, turns from the spoken BNC as well. So I've divided transcripts into um, individual turns and um and then analyzed each 
each turn as a text and, and run the approach there. And, and it's been really successful and it works really well. Um, and one such study, which I'm going to describe now, where I've applied short text multidimensional analysis to tweets, was to examine Donald Trump style over time. Now, specifically, we ran, me and Jack Greve, we ran a short text multidimensional analysis on a corpus of Donald Trump's tweets, ranging from 2009 to 2018. And this revealed um, various dimensions. We had a dimension reflecting the length of the tweets, and I can explain that more in the question and answer if you'd like, as to why it reflects text length. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail now. And then after the length of the text, uh, or with the first dimension, there were four more dimensions that we interpreted stylistically. Um, in particular, we found that Trump's tweets varied in terms of how conversational they were. So sometimes they were really conversational and uh, communicating with particular people. Other times they were a lot more informationally dense and, in, and more formal in style. Uh, the, next, the next pattern we found um, we revealed that Donald, Donald Trump's tweets varied in terms of how campaigning and promotional he was. We also found that his tweets varied in terms of how engaged they were, in, especially engaged in terms of engaging with the opinions of other people, whereas some uh, in other times he did not acknowledge the opinion of others and just spoke very categorically as if everything he said was a matter of fact. I mean, we all we all know that to be the case. And also we found that Donald Trump's tweets varied according to how advisory they were. So often he would be giving quite overt and explicit advice, especially advice that came from his book. And on the opposite end of this dimension, his tweets varied in terms of how adversarial they were. They were quite um, antagonistic. Now, as I mentioned, each individual and each category of a variable is assigned by the multiple correspondence analysis, a positive or negative coordinate and a value indicating its contribution to the dimension for each dimension. So when multiple correspondence analysis is used in short text multidimensional analysis, each text and each category of a linguistic feature, so the presence or the absence of a linguistic feature, is assigned a positive or negative coordinate and a contribution value for each dimension. So as you can see in this table, each text is assigned a coordinate value and a contribution value, and each category of the linguistic feature, so attributive adjectives with, that are absent, attributive adjectives if it's present in the text, is also assigned a coordinate and a contribution value as well. Now, because each text in particular is assigned a coordinate value for each dimension, it means that it's possible if your corpus is kind of um, is kind of tagged for dates or has meta information like if the date of posting, then it's possible to track how the functions and styles of tweets or texts vary over time. And that's what we, we did with Donald Trump's um communicative style we ended up tracking his communicative style over time and we did this by plotting 60 day moving averages by taking the mean coordinates of all the tweets in that particular period so 60 days every tweet posted within a 60 day we took the mean coordinate and we plotted it on a graph and this plot shows all of the trend lines for all the dimensions plotted on top of each other. And this is just specifically zooming in on the campaign period because our aim was to kind of explore whether there were particular points in time where Trump's style shifted among multiple dimensions during this period to see whether we could assess if he had a particular strategy or not. And we did, we found that, we definitely found that Donald Trump had a, arguably had a strategy in terms of his style whether it was intentional or just um or or just happened to be but one thing we found um was that Donald Trump's style shifts dep uh, shifted depending on his intended audience so in particular he became much more informal and conversational this is the blue line um, when he was trying to appeal to a, a Republican base and members of the public who shared his political views. But then he became more formal and informationally dense when he was trying to appeal to the general pu public. His tweets were substantially more conversational during the Republican primaries 
um, when when compared to the general election. So as you can see here, they come down, but they definitely are rising here during the primaries and things like that. And then they come, they come much more down. Now, I'm not going to go too much more into detail, but if you'd like to read more on that study, then you can read mine and Jack's open access paper. And within that paper as well, it's published in PLOS One. There are links to supplementary materials and scripts that were involved in running the multiple correspondence analysis and the time series analysis as well. So you can also, if you have your own data set, you can also run the same. Um, <clears throat> Now, the next approach that I developed um, that uses multiple correspondence analysis for corpus analysis is called keyword co-occurrence analysis. Now, what is keyword co-occurrence analysis? Well, it is an approach aimed at identifying patterns of co-occurring keywords across a corpus of texts, where keywords are words that occur with a significantly higher frequency when compared with a reference corpus. Now, like short text multidimensional analysis, this approach developed out of limitations with keyword analysis. Now, as we all know, keyword tools can point analysts towards keywords, which in turn allow access to discourses associated with some object of study. However, one challenge is in prizing apart the, the discourses that are within the list of keywords as the keywords may all be associated with the discourses that are present in the corpus. Now, different techniques have been developed for this task, such as by grouping keywords into thematic or semantic categories. Uh, and this can be done by closely reading the keywords in the context or, go, or using collocational analysis, among various other, th other strategies. However, all approaches have limitations and importantly, the creation of the meaningful categories and the assignment of keywords to those categories often involve some element of compromise, especially as keywords may contribute to more than one discourse. And determining where this happens is really a matter for the analyst. And as we all know, as corpora get larger, we often have to make some compromise on the number of concordance lines that or instances of the word that we look at and through these compromises, we can sometimes miss things. Um, we hope not that we don't, but it's a possibility. Now, the second challenge um, is with keyword analysis is that it tends to focus on the presence of keywords uh, over absence of keywords. Yet, as Schroeter and Taylor have emphasized, the absence can be just as meaningful as presence. And as Partington notes, patterns of presence and absence may meaningfully interact. And so it's really against this backdrop of limitations that I came up with a solution called keyword co-occurrence analysis, which aims to group the presence or absence of keywords according to how they co-occur with each other in the text of a corpus. In other words, rather than manually group keywords into thematic or semantic groups, which, as I said, can lead to different levels of compromise, keywords are instead grouped statistically based on their frequent co-occurrence in the text of the corpus. Now, keyword co-occurrence analysis is grounded in two notions. The first notion is linguistic co-occurrence, which suggests that frequent patterns of co-occurring linguistic features tend to reveal an underlying communicative function. As I said, this notion informs other methodologies like multidimensional analysis, but unlike multidimensional analysis, rather than identify patterns of co-occurring grammatical features, we, uh, Tony and Gavin, when I say we, me, Tony and Gavin, uh, wanted to identify patterns of co-occurring keywords. And so we hypothesized based on the notion of linguistic co-occurrence and the notion that keywords can allow us access to discourses, that frequent patterns of co-occurring keywords may reveal some common representations or discourses of an object of study. Now, to run keyword co-occurrence analysis, first of all, you need to compute your keyword list. And this is done through a regular keyword analysis using whatever statistic you like to use. Um, and that, I mean, uh, for those that don't know, keyword analysis is run by comparing a, your, your corpus of interest, your specialised corpus, to a reference corpus uh, and comparing the words, the frequencies of words in each um, uh, using a particular statistic, which reveals which ones are used more frequently. And um, 
And so, yeah, so you you run your keyword analysis using whatever statistic you like. I'm not really, I'm not bothered uh, about what you use. Um, and then once you've got your list of keywords, the next step is to analyze each text in your corpus for the presence or absence of those keywords and record it in a data, in a categorical data matrix. So essentially, like before, you have each text as a row, each keyword as a column, and then the cell represents whether that keyword is present or absent in the text. Once you've got your uh, data matrix, you then can then subject this to multiple correspondence analysis. And just in the same way as short text multidimensional analysis, you can interpret the dimensions of co-occurring keywords for the discourses to which they point. Now, the next step involves interpreting the dimensions. And this is one of the hardest tasks ever. <laughs> It's not easy to interpret um, dimensions anyway, especially with, of grammatical features in short text multidimensional analysis. But when it comes to interpreting dimensions of keywords, this is even more complicated. But this is the step that I tend to go through, the step by step. So first of all, I, I observe the keywords in the context of the text most associated with the dimension. I read the full text that are most strongly associated with the dimension. And then I would produce a kind of short descriptive label that captures the opposition between the keywords and the text on each side of the dimension. And it, I, I've been developing an analytical framework for this task where uh, with a question, the questioning vaccination discourse team in uh, at Lancaster University, we've been looking at different things that keywords might point to because it's not just discourse and especially the study that Tony Gavin and I did, we found also there was a link to sub register so we account So the analytical framework that we've been developing is trying to account for all these different um, categories and things that you need to look out for when you're looking at co-occurrence of keywords. Once you've got this label anyway, once you've got this label, uh, the next step is to try and falsify the label. Um, you do this by looking at less strongly associated text. So as I said, each text is assigned a, a coordinate and a contribution value indicating how associated it is to the dimension. So you would look at less strongly associated texts and you would see whether that label upholds. If it, it, if it doesn't uphold and if you can falsify that label, then, the next, then you need to refine the label and you repeat steps three to five until you finally are happy with, um, with your dimension label. Now, I've applied um, keyword co-occurrence analysis to a variety of a variety of different kind of corpora, and it has been used to identify discourses, registers, and rep repertoires across these different corpora. Uh, I've used it to look at um, Islam in the UK press, as uh, Pascal said, noted before. I've been I've used it to look at the representation of climate change across pseudoscience and conspiracy websites. Um, I've also been working with the questioning vaccination discourse team at Lancaster to look at H HPV vaccination on Twitter. As my Leverhulme funded research, I've been looking at anti-science, um, a variety of different topics, including climate change, but also vaccination, stem cells, um, genetically modified organisms and evolution as well across conspiracy and pseudoscience websites. And um, my lovely husband has also been applied the technique to ch look at children's disclosures of abuse um, as well. And he's found some really interesting patterns using the technique. Now, similar to short text multidimensional analysis and what we what Jack and I did with the Donald Trump paper, um, when it comes to analysing keyword co-occurrence, each text and each category of a keyword is, is assigned a positive or negative coordinate and a value indicating its contribution. And so as a result, in much the same way as what we did with Trump's, the Trump paper, we were able to plot these coordinates over time to see how discourses and shift as well over time and respond to particular events. So this is an example of a plot from a Tony, Gavin and I study investigating Islam in the UK press. This dimension reflects the discourses of war, terrorism, and conflict, which are on the which is on the positive side, and everyday life and events discourse on the negative side. So each dot 
uh, on the plot is an articles coordinate from the corpus that we looked at of UK press articles. And the trend line is the 60 day moving average of all the coordinates of articles in that 60 day period. Now, when the trend line rises, articles are more associated with the positive side of the dimension, which is associated with this war, terrorism and discourse, war, terrorism and conflict discourse. And when the trend line dips, uh, it indicates that articles are more associated with just describing everyday life and events of Islam and Islamic people. So what this plot shows is that there's a kind of general strengthening of the war, terrorism and conflict discourse up until about 2014. And this is probably um, driven by events, well, this was driven by events such as the Arab Spring protests and revolutions. But really prior to 2014, what this shows is that generally texts are less associated with war, terrorism and conflict, and more associated with just describing everyday life and events. But come 2014, um, with the rise of ISIS and the Syrian civil war, we see this discourse of war, terrorism and conflict rise. And we have a variety of different peaks and these correspond with particular terror attacks um, that occurred within the West. Uh, the largest ones occur when they occur on, in the West, um, but they're also ones that occur in, in other countries as well that are, are still associated with this side. So that in particular, this large, the largest peak here shows that reportage at the end of 2015 in the UK, National Islam Press, was dominated by war, terrorism and conflict. As you can see, there are barely any dots in this particular period describing just everyday life and events of, it, of Islamic people. Um, and so this particular peak is actually aligned with Operation Shamal, which refers to French airstrikes on ISIS in Syria and Iraq, and as well as the 13th of November, 2015 Paris terror attacks by ISIS. And yeah, so that the, this these kinds of plots can really show how um, how the discourse changes and shifts from one side to the to the other over time and how event, how really the discourses within particular texts, i.e. this is with newspapers, how they respond to real life events. Now, in a different study, uh, myself and the question and vaccination discourse team have applied this technique to a corpus of tweets mentioning HPV vaccination, as I've said. And we have every tweet um, that mentioned HPV vaccination from 2008 right up to the end of 2022. And this is the plot of dimension number two. And we've interpreted this as representing the discourse of childhood vaccinations on the positive side with the discourse um, on the negative side, that represents just providing HPV vaccination information. Now, when tweets draw on the discourse of childhood vaccines, um, the HP vaccine is mentioned as just one of many other vaccines administered to children, including MMR, polio, hepatitis B, and so on. And while tweets draw, that draw, in, and on the opposite side, Tweets that draw on the discourse of HPV vaccination information are often providing information on the HPV vaccine only. So whilst on the positive side, they're discussing HPV as one of many other vaccines. When tweets are associated with the negative side, they tend to just be discussing HPV vaccine. And they include things such as the impact of the vaccine on rates of genital warts and cervical cancer among women following vaccination. And they're often sharing news reports about studies on HPV vaccine showing um, how eff like effective it is and, and communicating just general information on the HPV vaccine. And so what this trend line shows is that tweets are largely communicating about the HPV vaccine and information on HPV vaccine and right up until 2019. Um, but then suddenly in 2019, the trend line becomes positive, dipping only slightly into the negative side um, and in the middle of the 2019, but then got continuing up until the end of um, at the end of our corpus, but it's right up there on the positive side. And what these peaks coincide with is the discovery of COVID and the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines worldwide. 
And as I said, this this is because when the back HPV isn't just discussed um, solely, it's discussed with other childhood vaccines as well. And so that what this indicates is that there's greater mention of other childhood vaccinations in addition to HPV in tweets during this time. In other words, the discovery of COVID-19 and the advent of COVID-19 vaccines led to increased discussions of other vaccinations, including the HPV vaccine. There are also, as you know, during this during that particular time, many discussions concerning whether COVID-19 vaccines should be administered to children. And such tweets during this time draw on the HPV vaccination as one of many vaccines that are given to children in order to illustrate their point about the COVID vaccination, whether that was in support of the COVID vaccine or against it. And um, sometimes they would discuss um again, this this draws on multiple kind of pro and anti-vaccination discourses. Uh, people expressing those pro or anti sentiment but the the kind of underlying discourse is these childhood vaccines and so really what this plot shows is the impact of covid on discussions of hpv vaccine and uh, this is probably no surprise to anyone anyone on twitter during that particular time differently would have noticed this now um despite these uh, interesting results and very meaningful plots Multiple correspondence analysis when used in these approaches does have a few limitations and I will address these. So as I noted, short text multidimensional analysis has been usefully applied in all these different corpora of short text. However, what these studies have shown is that it works consistently well on short texts that are below 100 words. But when text starts to become longer than 100 words, then there's a lot more noise and the results are harder to interpret. And this is when we're talking about kind of grammatical features here with short text multidimensional analysis. And this is because the longer the texts are, the more likely they are going to have the presence of features. So the approach looks at the presence or absence of features. If we have longer texts, those grammatical features, especially the high frequency ones, are always going to be present. And so as a result, they can't, when you have longer texts and running the short text approach, there's very little variation. And really the main variation occurs in the absences of linguist of grammatical features. So you might just you might have loads of all the texts tend to have all the features, but there might just be a couple of texts that have just an absence of a particular feature. And that will be strongly associated with the dimension. So dimensions might only consist of absences of features. And absences of grammatical features are very tricky to interpret. Uh, so it's a word of warning. It works really well on consistently short texts, uh, those that are below 100 words. But as texts start to become a bit longer, then they are, it doesn't work as well. Or it does work, it just is harder to interpret. Again, um, with the keyword co-occurrence analysis, as I said, this has been applied really well to different corpora and it's re revealed some really useful and interesting patterns. Um, now, in general, because keywords occur less frequently than high frequency grammatical features used in standard multidimensional analysis, the length of the text doesn't really seem to be so much of an issue, um, although this has yet to be tested um, more robustly. So with the newspaper corpus, the majority of the texts were under a thousand words. The anti-science texts that I've been looking at are, are very mixed. We have short and long texts, quite a few texts that are above a thousand words, and it seems to work really well still. And the tweets and the disclosures of abuse are tend to be short texts and it works really well on them. But obviously this is something that really needs to be tested. It may this may prove to be a, a limitation of the approach as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm working on a kind of validation of that. Now, limitations to multiple correspondence more generally, this is something that you might come into contact with, is that multiple correspondence analysis is a high dimensional approach. So if you have 63 linguistic features, uh, each feature has two categories, the multiple correspondence analysis can return up to 63 dimensions. Now, the variance of the cloud, um, so this is this is probably quite high, highly statistical, but essentially it, all the dimensions make up one. Uh, that, or that's like 100 percent. And each dimension explains a particular percentage of variance. And this is explained through the eigenvalues. But because you might have 63 dimensions, 
the percentage of variance so the 100 percent needs to be divided by 63 dimensions and so as a result the percentage of variance explained by the dimensions tends to be quite low now ben Sucre, he introduced modified rates and this can be used to reveal more clearly the importance of the first few dimensions <clears throat> And when you do run this on the dimensions of short text MDA, it really does show uh, the influence of the first few dimensions. But the first dimension in particular tends to be assigned um, really high percentage of variance. But because it tends to explain text length, we, we tend to ignore it and we focus on the other ones. So it's um it's kind of a bitter pill. I, find, I think the modified rates are important and they can be used with the keyword studies um because they don't always reflect text length um but when it comes to short text mda you can kind of get a bit bogged down by the fact that you use them so i think i think i think it's it's a tricky one it's um it's just a general limitation of multiple correspondence analysis but as you will be able to see when you start interpreting patterns that they are robust they do occur in lots of the data and it's just a shame that um, they don't really reveal you can't have like in a traditional multivariate statistical technique you have these eigenvalues and percentage of variance they're not kind of like for like you couldn't run a factor analysis on the same and say oh well this factor analysis uh, interprets more um has a high percentage of variance it's just not you can't really compare luck with like so to conclude, um, I've shown you two, just two different approaches where multiple correspondence analysis has been used to identify and visualize relationships between linguistic features in texts of corpram. Uh, in addition to the, these two, appro uh, two approaches, multiple correspondence analysis has also been used to investigate polysemic words in corpora, and it's also been used to unveil confounding variables in corpus linguistics as well. I've also noticed um, as a kind of ad hoc one, I've also noticed when I've applied this to corpora that I think I've deduplicated, I've revealed that actually uh, I have not deduplicated it and it can show where texts are duplicates because they share lots of linguistic features. So it can also perhaps be a strategy if you're if you're trying to see if you've successfully deduplicated your corpus you, you can apply this technique and you'll be at, you, it might be able to provide you or show you where you haven't <laughs> um so overall uh what i i hope i have shown is that multiple correspondence analysis is a powerful statistical technique and i hope that this encourages future corpus linguistics research to keep applying it to different corpora and for different tasks as well as to test its limitations these are my references and I'd just like to say thank you very much Pascal for having me okay thank you so much Isabel thank you thank you so much um exciting uh chat action going on here good with comments and questions <laughs> so I will try to do my best here I will start with some probably more general questions and then we will try to move to more specific questions um, that would probably need lots of expertise on on um, um, on the on the researcher to actually uh, sort of interpret uh, I suppose um so I suppose some of the questions here Sorry. Uh, some of the questions here um um want to know more about the specific tools that you use to sort of generate your your results maybe you could you could just uh, briefly comment on what type of tools you use on a regular basis uh, yeah so i am um, in order to first of all tag tag each text i for different linguistic lexicogrammatical features i've actually written my own tag um so that's um that's one that i developed that works off uh, the twitter tagger um, so that's that's the first tool that I use. Um, then in order to record the linguistic features in a data matrix, I've also written my own script, um, which again, I'm more than happy to share that just goes through each text and records whether that linguistic feature is present or absent. And then once you do, once you've got your data matrix, I then use R um to read I read in the data matrix into R and I use the package Factominer. 
um, which has multiple correspondence analysis built into it. But there are other other um, packages that have multiple correspondence analysis in. I just use that one because it's um, it's there's a lot of um, kind of uh not i want to say literature but uh, there's a lot of a lot of kind of package tools and helps to helpful information that guides you through it Gu guides that's the word that i was looking for uh and then once i once i've got my results i then tend to pull them out of r and i look at them just in the spreadsheet and looking at the text as well um just reading reading them so that's what I do uh, with keyword um, with the keyword analysis. I've used a variety of different um, tools. I've used, uh, um, I mean, I've used Sketch Engine for my anti-science data to compute the keywords. Uh, I've also written my own script that uh, incorporates uh, Andrew Hardy's log ratio um, for the keyword statistic that works in R. Um, so you can also, um, I can share that as well at some point. Uh, but there's also um, uh, Stefan, is it Stefan Greece? He's also got um, helpful step-by-step -step guides on incorporating different keyword um, statistics to run keyword analysis in R as well. So there's lots of different things that you can use. And then the same process uh, for recording the presence or absence of the keywords in each text. Okay, great. So I've, I, I tend to... I feel that uh, uh, this is, I mean, this is a question that is is of great interest to uh, researchers as they probably want to know more about exactly the tools and the methods that are used out there. But the more I ask this question, the more I, I am aware that most researchers use a variety of tools. So it, I suppose, depends on the particular nature of the text that you are using or your corpus data. And then you, I suppose there is some flexibility in terms of, of how you go about using this particular maybe package or this particular uh, index, whether you want to go for, you know, just uh, keyword analysis through Sketch Engine, Simple Maths, or you want to favor, uh, as you said, uh, log ratio or anything like that. Yeah. But yeah, it's um yeah, this is this is becoming a classic question, but it is also complex. Uh, it, it is not straightforward to. No, but I think that's like where it it needs to be. I, I don't, I'm not going to tell you which one's best to use. I don't think there is such a thing as saying which one is best. It does vary depending on your data set, and I mean, with my anti-science data in particular, that was all um. They're all websites um, and web pages, and so I needed in order to get my rep, uh, in order to get my keyword list, I wanted a reference corpus that was most uh, typical of just standard web pages. So to get rid of all that fluff of web pages sort of, sorts of characteristics, I wanted to really see what was distinctive in terms of the words, and so um, I that I that's why I selected. Uh, sketch engine as my tool so I could use the n10 1020 corpus uh, as my com as my reference corpus as I felt that that was the best available widely available um, reference corpus that I could use but again that like that that and that meant then that I used simple maths method um, but again there's nothing there's nothing really wrong with simple maths method the, it, it has its it has it of course some limitations um, but I uh, um, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, by the way, somebody wanted to know more about how you conceptualize uh, pseudoscience. So, in your own research, how do you what what is pseudoscience, or what do you consider as pseudoscience? In your yes, own I, uh, I, I'm again, I'm not going to impart my own um, view of what pseudoscience is. Instead, I draw on a website called mediabiasfactcheck.com. And on that website, there are different tabs. And one of the tabs and it, the, the, the website is aimed at kind of classifying different websites according to different levels of bias. So it might be left bias, left leaning bias, right bias pseudoscience conspiracy um and all these sorts of things and so it and on each tab there's a particular tab 
dedicated to pseudoscience and conspiracy websites and it just lists all websites that have been rated as pseudoscience or conspiracy um so known for i guess their their definition is known for spreading conspiracy theories or known for um to uh kind of presenting things in a scientific way yet they're not science science like homeopathic remedies or something like that to treat different ailments but um and so it would list different websites so i've just taken their list of websites and been quite not lazy but i don't want to i want to be as objective as i can and and then and use theirs okay uh jenny has a question for you can keyword coherence analysis work well on corpora of other languages? Um, this researcher is conducting a study on poverty, dominant poverty discourses in Chinese social media, and uh, has been thinking about applying this method to to these to this data. So I suppose that the question is about: Are you aware of other research that has looked at other languages using? and these same approach um no but i'd love to love to hear and see how well it works i can't imagine that it wouldn't not work i think it will work really well on another language as well you just ha would have your keywords created through using a different reference corpus uh, more specific to the language that you're interested in and then run the approach and interpret the discourses and it would be very interesting i'd be very interested to read it Great. Okay. Um, so let's move on to more technical questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, Javier, this is on the Q and A uh, uh, box. So Javier, wonderful lecture. Uh, two questions. When you applied MCA to Trump's short messages, every linguistic feature was categorized through only two levels, like either present or absent, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, would the method allow for multiple level categorical variables? Like for example, uh, something which could be described as pervasive or frequent scars, absent, mm -hmm. defined by the actual relative frequency in the texts. Mm -hmm. So- Okay, so I'll answer that first. I see there's two questions. I'll answer that first question. Um, so it's not, it's not that it wouldn't allow it. You could certainly, you could certainly do it. Um, I would not, I would, I would not, first of all, I would not compute the relative frequencies of linguistic features in short text. As I said, they're like, these are problematic. They're not accurate estimations of what they would be in larger samples. So you can't compare like we like. We like. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily compute the relative frequencies and then divide them into pervasive, frequent, scarce, absent. But you can have perhaps bins of um, of ranges of linguistic features. This is certainly something that I've thought about before. Um, I haven't yet yet tried it myself. But you could have, um, say, you you had uh, got your raw frequencies of of all the linguistic features you could then say oh okay well the majority of texts um have are between six and ten um six and ten instances and then you might have four and th uh from five till sorry i'm working backwards it's not helpful so like you might have zero instances then one to two or one to three and then you but you would have to determine what those bins would be and justify every single bin um and that would that would vary as well so it's there's a lot of steps that are involved in that it's probably why i haven't gone and tried it but lots of things to consider one first of all you can't do the relative frequencies second what you could do is create bins but those bins would not be the same for every single linguistic feature they would vary according to how the frequencies of the linguistic features across all the texts in the corpus um and then and yeah so it would just be a lot of decision making and um i don't envy that task at all but it doesn't mean that it can't it can't happen you could try it, certainly try it and when you do do it please share with me your uh um how it works because i'll be really interested to see 
the second question is, which is the R function or functions in fact I minor that computes and visualizes MCA? So um, it's the function is MCA and then the brackets, that's the function. And to make the lovely plot that comes from the package facto extra. Um, again, I can share that share that with you. Just drop me an email and I'll be more than happy to share that. And those functions are fviz underscore mca underscore and then some form of plot. Can't remember what one it is, but uh, that's just off the top of my head. Great. Lovely. Thank you so much. Can we move on to Christian's question below? Mm -hmm. So Christian says, could you explain in more detail how the dimensional values, negative 0.2 and positive 0.12, et cetera, are assigned if the variables that enter the analysis are simply categorical? In other words, how do you move from one to the other? Can this be automatically detected by the script you've been using? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand. Um, how do you move from one to the other as if? So uh, maybe Chris, and maybe you can you can um, offer more context for the question. You you can use the chat if if you like. There. Uh, uh, meanwhile, you mean can... so so I could give it. I could just talk you through. So um, if you had the presence of Islam and the absence of Islam on a dimension, um, of for dimension one, for instance, the presence will probably will be pro positive and the absence of it would be negative and it's assigned a coordinate um, based on all the instances in all the texts of that particular linguistic features presence and also of its absence and based on the individual so the different texts that have it as well as other features of, that you're interested in they are closer or not so the coordinate it takes into consideration every single instance, every single variable, every single individual and all the linguistic features and slowly but surely will move further and further apart based on how much it shares. So it's just real maths behind it. There's um, the the formula and things that you could look up uh, if you like, but it is um, it, the distance is based on a variety of different things. In, but based on the whole data set so you couldn't just um look at one that makes sense i hope i've explained that well <laughs> yeah i think so Kristen says yeah this is this is what i meant so, oh, oh, oh. so okay I suppose you, uh, you sorry i'm not looking at the chat <laughs> no I, I know it's it's, it's, it's <laughs> you do everything. I just... uh i think a couple of people here wanted to uh, ask you if you could repeat the name give us uh, the name yeah it's the website media, you use. yeah i'll just type it in it's media bias fact check dot com brilliant oh that's, that's yes. really it's a really helpful website and um, that they're ranking it themselves uh so we don't have to <laughs> but obviously you could check you could test it as well so it's up for dispute right there's two or three questions about the length of the texts mm -hmm. it's a very key question for corporate linguists yeah uh, we we always want to know more about and i was thinking i was thinking uh back in the day when uh, uh doug biber's 1988 first multi-dimensional analysis the the text length there was 2,000 words, although they were not, you know, just intact or complete texts, just the first 2,000 words, uh, which is debatable. Why the first 2,000 words and not the, you know, just uh, M plus 100, 2,000 words or anything like that. Anyway, um, so Christian also has another question, a very interesting question here in terms of, uh, of whether you have experience of using corpora that contains texts of varying size like texts that are really small together with texts that tend to be probably larger so how do, i suppose the question is how does all of that factor in the analysis and whether you feel that 
um, this is my question that that could be biased or could be a yeah problem. so I mean I have um we've been I've been working with some new data sets and that's um that's sort of some research that hopefully will be coming out soon um but definitely with the stuff looking at discourse units in the BNC discourse units in the Trinity Lancaster corpus these are um these are of varying length they can be relatively uh short as in like they under 100 words um, but then they can also be a little bit longer as well and uh, this isn't that they occur above a thousand words for short text multi-dimensional analysis so this is where we're looking at grammatical features and the effect is that it's really hard to interpret what happens is the variation exists only in the absences of features and absences of features are really hard to interpret. So you can sometimes assume that perhaps the presence would be on the opposite side and interpret what the presence would be if it, if it occurred and it was there. What's the function of its presence versus what's the function of its ab and then you could assume that the absence is the opposite of that, but it's really tricky with keyword cover occurrence analysis. My corpora for the anti-science corpus and um, and also with the newspaper text, that was very varied. They were, with the newspaper stuff, they were all tended to be, most of them were under, I think about 70% were under a thousand words, but there were still 30% of the text that were over a thousand words. Or that might, that, that's probably the wrong percentage, but there were still some that were over a thousand words that were longer. Um, and that didn't seem to really have too much of an influence on here. It, um, when you're just looking at those keywords in the context, that's what your aim is to trust, really try and interpret what that function is, um, what discourse is it, it's contributing. So you're looking at those keywords in context, in addition to reading the whole text, but you have to just really focus on those keywords. So, um, so with keyword, so to summarise, keyword co-occurrence analysis, it doesn't really matter that much, I don't think. Uh, it's yet to be tested, but with uh, with the grammatical features, it's really tricky to interpret, and it means that the dimensions just consist of absences of features, and that's not at all helpful. Okay. So yeah, I think that's just so much to think about in in only that answer, really. Especially absence is uh, such a fascinating area to think about. Yeah, I mean, uh, interpreting the absence of some linguistic features can be quite easy, but some the absence of a particular feature is not. Other features are very hard. <laughs> yeah, maybe lots of assumptions going on. Yeah, how you go about that, I suppose. Okay, so I'm afraid we have to uh, stop here. Um, it's almost uh, tea dinner time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some people need to rush for their dinner. Some people have to rush for their breakfast. I know as well. Some people have to <laughs> rush for some sleep. So. Uh, yeah. Well, thank uh, you so thank much you. for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I think it's, it's been a fantastic talk. Uh, and also so much to think about and probably try ourselves in terms of incorporating these, these methods into our own research. Thanks everyone that joined these, uh, these uh, session today, these talk today, and um, I will see you soon next week, right? For the fourth and last talk of these series of, uh, of talks, 2023. Uh, Isabel, thanks again. And thank, thank you everyone that joined today, all right? Okay, see you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.